After years of helping online businesses make more money by advising them on their taxes and finances, I've now made it my mission to reach as many profitable online businesses as possible to help them save on their taxes and make more money. On my quest, I bring you proven and real profitable online business owners, and we dig into how they do it. All right. Hello again. Thanks for being here on the few, the proud, the profitable. This is the podcast where we talk exclusively to six and seven figure online business owners. We know that in this space, there's a lot of people who exaggerate, who inflate, who abrogate. So what we do here is we only talk to the people who have really done it. We personally vet our guests, make sure they're legit. So we're taking the guesswork out of it for you. We've got one of those today. Taylor Welsh. Thanks for being here, man. Dude, that is the coolest name of any podcast I've ever heard. With you, the proud, the profitable. Well, and like we were saying before we started a little bit, that's not the few aspect is not what most people make it seem like. If you talk to anyone who's doing business online, they claim that they are just absolutely crushing it. They're billionaires. Billionaires. Yeah. Yeah. But what we found is that it's our favorite niche to work in. I think there's the most potential to be hugely successful compared to other industries, but doing it successfully the way y'all do is extremely difficult. And I don't think people realize that based on people's Instagram and Facebook posts. Yeah. hundred percent. Well, we are very profitable. So yeah, (laughs) I belong here. Yeah. (laughs) So yeah, so just to get started, tell everybody who's listening who doesn't know, who don't know who you are, tell them who you are and what do you do? So I run Traffic and Funnels with my business partner, Chris Evans, out on the East Coast. Um, uh, We also run WealthCout, which is a holdings company, and we run Sales Mentor, which is a sales consultancy. So we kind of do a few things. Um, The biggest company is a consultancy. We take people who want to advertise online. They want to take control of their uh, business customer list and their client acquisition. They just don't necessarily know how, or they're lost in a sea of gurus all giving conflicting advice. They're like, well, someone please just be honest with me. So we have, you know, over 20,000 customers, um, about three or 4,000 clients all over the world. And uh, we help them run advertising. We help them become profitable. And uh, we do all that via events and online coaching and one-on-one group, all the above. And then with WealthCap, we just go out, we buy real estate and, um, you know, try to become slumlords. Chris wants to be a slumlord when he grows up. So that's his long-term vision. (laughs) Yeah, that's the opposite issue we have with our real estate is we try to make things nicer than... um then the cap rate and the ROI would justify. Yeah. We try. Chris is like, <laughs> man, just give me some mobile homes and uh, let me put Slumlord on my license plate. I think that's actually his goal. I thought he was kidding at first, but I think he's serious. Let's well, it, it, it's funny. I mean, the money you can make on those is crazy, especially if you look at trailer parks. Mm. Yeah. It's a different world to live in, but the money you can make is pretty astounding on the lower. I think level. people overestimate how expensive like when you get a class a multifamily unit with 100 doors man your return on that's going to be a little low because of how expensive those buildings are you can Mm -hmm. go and get a trailer park with 100 doors and you can work out some crazy lending because it's a trailer park Mm -hmm. and your leverage is going to explode you know well, I think people for any, it's like anything you're buying, the shinier something is, the more appealing it is in terms of occupancy, how nice it is, neighborhood, all of that, you you might find a deal here and there, but all of that's built into the price. If yeah. you're going to things that are generally objectively less appealing, usually you can get a, a nicer price and usually a better ROI. Bro, my, my dream businesses are the boring businesses that nobody wants to get into and once you get into them, the barrier of entry is high enough that you have your own moats. Like, right. you know, Warren Buffett talks about moats. Dude, nobody wants to own a garage door repair company. Right. Sorry, not hating on anybody. If you fix no. garage doors, I love you. But nobody wants that. That's the company I want to own because mm-hmm. nobody's going to be coming in and copying my stuff, you know? Well, it's all the people out there who want to, I think about how everyone wants to be financial advisors. 
because that sounds so cool and we help people with their money. And I'm not hanging on financial advisors either. I, my dad's a financial advisor, but I see so many people who are attracted to these things and way everyone wants to be gurus and they want to be consultants and coaches. Nothing wrong with those as industries, but because of the, the sexiness of it, it's yeah. got this magnetism of everyone thinks that's what they want to do. Thousand percent. That is a massive cup of coffee, by the way. Pretty big. You're, well, I mean, I think it's good more perspective. The, the further that, that's what it is, probably. I was like, geez, how big is that cup of coffee? I think it's like 16 ounces, not crazy. But going to the, the face, the stuff y'all do on the consulting side, I've ha I can't name names because this is published, but I've had clients who have gone through some of y'all's training who have done very well with it. Yeah, we have close to $60 million a year in verified income from clients. Mm -hmm. so, so again, without giving too much of what the secret sauce is, I do find that interesting. And I want to talk about how y'all achieve that because there are so many people who are, whether or not they're actually as experts, there are ostensibly a ton of experts in y'all's space and people who claim they're able to get these results. So what's one of the sort of differentiating factors y'all have found to achieve that success for your people? I mean, let's just go after that first one, which is the sexiness factor. We, uh, we tend to strip everything away. When a client comes in, we'll strip everything down to, let's just figure out what's going to work for your model, your market, and your vision. What are your goals? Not everybody comes in wanting to do 750000 a month in sales. Sometimes people come in and they're like, hey, I, want, I only want to work with uh, you know, single moms who are trying to escape a job and I want to make thirty grand a month. Okay, the strategy for you is going to be a lot different than yeah. somebody who's like, I want to teach personal trainers how to get rich and make a million dollars a month. They're totally different people. There's so many cookie cutter people in the, in the world of this business today. They're all selling one thing and it's this flagship thing and you come in, you go through the course and it's like, no matter what your goals are, you have to conform your mission to fit the program. And we don't really do that. We kind of flip it around. Um, and it's actually made us uh, very agile in our ability to coach clients because not, uh, we're not going to really teach advanced retargeting if you make four grand a month because you don't need that. You know, we're not going to teach you how to buy real estate if you make, you know, if you made $2,500 last month and you're trying to figure out how to get your next client. Everything is stripped down to what's going to work right now. And what's funny is we've gotten a lot of hate on this, bro, because people come in and they're like, we want to write a book. We're like, don't write a book. Please, God, don't write a book. Like nobody gives a shit about you. Like don't take this the wrong way, but nobody wants to read your book. Yeah. And then we've had to learn how to refine that advice to be like, you know, giving people what they need when what they need is not what they want. Mm -hmm. And there's some, there's a profound secret in that because uh, we are not willing to compromise what works just to make a bunch of fanboys happy. And so we've really refined over the years. Like you get in, you do one thing, you do it really well. Let's get you up to a seven figure run rate. And then you can write any book you want because you've earned the right to do that. Mm -hmm. So we're very ruthless, very meritocratic inside of the, the game we play and with our clients. So why do y'all get hate for that? Because to me, that, may, that all makes perfect sense. Because there's a thousand ways to do things. And I think, you know, um, the, the term like, these lifestyle businesses or, you know, these enlightened uh, type entrepreneurs, they're so concerned with alignment and like, man, let, like there's, I remember one person in particular and I'm not going to say, say their name. Not even going to tell you whether they're a boy or a girl. This is, I'm going to take all the, all the hints away. And uh, they kept wanting to do these things that weren't going to make them money. And we kept pushing back and telling them not to do it. And eventually they left the program. They, they were in a mastermind. They stopped. They went and they hired somebody else who could teach them what they wanted to do. And uh, I checked in on them about six months after and it didn't work. And it went, it, their business had actually moved backwards. And uh, most of the time people are hiring mentors not to teach them what to do, but to justify what they want to do. <laughs> You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Well, it's like you, you said, teach them what they want, want to do, but teach them what they want to hear. What it's, it's just this reinforcement, not necessarily yes. where they should be going, but yeah, like you said, um, 
where they want to go. There's, there's a phrase that you sometimes about having your ears tickled. I think there's a lot of people who are guilty of, of that being the basis of how they hire their coaches. Yeah. They want, they want, like we all have to look at our own lives and make sure we're not guilty of this. Like hiring mentors to justify what we've already decided we wanted to do. That way we can blame the mentor if it doesn't work out. And that's just childish. You know, mm -hmm. uh, when we hired Jay, we were like, tell us what to do, bro. Like, we'll do anything you tell us to do. And I think that that's given us an advantage because even if we don't intellectually understand what we're being advised to do, okay, well, we'll try it. Like, we're not the smartest people in the world. We haven't built billion dollar brands. We'll do anything people tell us to do, even if we don't necessarily understand what that means. And there's a lot of ego, you know. Mm -hmm. All of this really stems, to, stems down to ego. There's a lot of ego in the business today. And uh, we just try to kill that pretty quick. Yeah. Well, and I think that's natural for entrepreneurs because to an extent to, to jump out on your own, to be the face of a company, even if it's a tiny little company, to do a lot of the stuff that you deal with get, getting started, I think you need a little bit of ego to get past that first hurdle. But then as we're trying to scale and when we're trying to achieve, okay, I'm not just self-employed, but I'm building some sort of true enterprise here. I think the ego is what gets in the way of a lot of us really scaling. Yeah. You got to have a lot of confidence in the beginning. Yeah. You know. But then you got to be able to, like you're saying, you got to be able to taper that off later on. Well, I think confident people can still be teachable. And that's mm -hmm. where I think that's ego true. really robs yeah. you. Right. Like I, I, if you look at me and you look at how I communicate, um, there's no doubt that there's in certain situation, there is superiority. Uh, it would be childish for me to say that there's not, it would yeah. be childish for you to say that there's not, because if we're talking about money, you know, I outrank certain people. It doesn't mean that I'm better mm -hmm. as a human being. It just means I'm superior in my viewpoint of a certain topic. Mm -hmm. But I'm still teachable. And I used to have this thing where like I would only listen to you if you made more money than I did. And that, that's what I define as like the downside of ego because that was stupid. You know, like I, yeah. the people at the top, they're willing to learn from anybody, bro. Like there are people that make way more money than I do that have listened to me and listened to what I have to say and I've learned and I've latched onto that. It's like, it doesn't matter whether I have a, you know, have confidence in myself or whatever. If I cannot, if I lose the ability to listen to other people, regardless of where they are in their life, then I'm going to have a blind spot somewhere and sure. somebody's going to beat me in, in the game if, if I don't fix that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I can use myself in a, as an example. We've got a, we make good money. We've got a perfectly nice business and what I consider to be quite successful, but we deal with clients who are making millions and millions of dollars a year. Yeah. So if my clients had that same viewpoint, well, like, dude, you're not making anywhere close to what I'm They wouldn't listen to you, yeah. They <laughs> wouldn't listen to me. But in the things that they're doing, in what they're, you know, there's different cliches. They'll use your realm of genius and whatever their niche is. They are experts. They are fantastic. And because they're in such high demand, they're able to make way more money than I am. But in the thing that they hired me for, Yep. In this little world that I live in, there, there's no comparison. But if you've got too much ego about everything, then then you're setting yourself up for some degree of failure, or at least a stymieing your growth. Hundred percent. All right, awesome, man. Well, we've got a couple questions we usually ask, but I know we're not we don't have a ton of time, so I'm going to skip to the main one, which cool. is for anyone who's listening. What's the tip that you think that every online business owner should know? One of your main tips or a series of tips? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm. I was in Tampa uh, a few weeks ago, and somebody I was speaking at an event, and somebody came into the microphone and was like, "I'm." they said, I'm familiar with your work on normalization, which is like, for me, it's a big deal because I'm just now starting to hit events. I'm just now starting to hit a lot of podcasts. And uh, to hear that something that I've kind of pioneered is getting bigger than me is awesome. And I would have to start there with normalization. And the, the principle is this, whatever you're wanting in whatever area of life that you're desiring, it, whether it's finances or relationships or fulfillment or uh, whatever it is, there's somebody on this wonderful planet who already has it, who's already gone through the trouble of figuring it out, 
who's already built it, retained it, held on to it. And the more you're willing to get around that person, the faster and easier you're going to attain it yourself. This is this idea of just like every single level I'm trying to break into, whether it's real estate holdings, whether it's people, leadership, being a better dad, I am finding the people who I feel like are further along. And I'm just, if I have to pay them to spend sure. time with them, I'll pay them. If I can, uh, if I can do something for free for them, I'll do it for free just to get around them. And I think there are too many people struggling alone mm -hmm. who are just like, man, why would you waste your life on trial and error? It doesn't make any sense. There's, there's a thousand people who already have the secrets. And so that would be the, if you wanted the cornerstone tip that would make everything else either irrelevant or easier, it would be get around somebody who already has what you want and they'll make it easier for you. You know what I mean? Yeah, that, well, that makes perfect sense. And it, it goes a little bit to what we were talking about before about not having this ego with everything because I think we, we think a lot of ourselves, we think we're smart guys and gals. And sometimes we do that to the exclusion of taking advice from other people. So especially if you're doing it the way you're looking at, not only, okay, this guy's smart, he has this train, whatever, but this guy has where I want to be. And then yeah. hiring them, being around, however you get around them to, to sort of help them carve out that pathway for you makes yeah. a ton of sense. Hands down. Yep. Well, I think about this as a specific example for our stuff, but we had, there was this one really niche, like international tax issue. It had to do with Amazon sellers and some stuff on whether or not you've got obligate tax obligations. I won't get into the um, specifics of it, but 95% of what I was finding online, I knew the answer, but I couldn't find a citation for it. 95% of what I was finding online was wrong. It was saying the exact opposite thing. I'm like, this is not right there. And so finally I find this tax lawyer who outlined it perfectly. This dude lives in Belize of all places. Now he's used to work for big firms. So I'm like, I hired him for probably two or three hours that I don't even remember what the rate was. It was probably like 500 bucks an hour, but getting that guidance for, and this was a technical thing, not so much a goal thing, but that was worth every penny because I could have spent the next week searching through references and finding it, not having the level of confidence that I had it right, not having the level of understanding I had by hiring him. And I could have cheaped out and done that, but by not saying, hey, it's Micah, CPA, tax expert, no one knows taxes better than me, by having some degree of humility on whatever your goals are, I think you, it's this huge shortcut that you can have. Absolutely. So yeah, I mean, that, that makes perfect sense from, from my end, but we've talked about ego. Do you think there's any, do you think there's any other factor why there can be such resistance to people doing that? Uh, I think that people like get so much identity today from being looked up to and they I, people are hypersensitive to anything that reduces their status. I don't know if you studied any like Jordan Peterson stuff or yeah, that is just so evolutionary. And even today, you know, most of the things that are going to hold a person back are probably old survival techniques from a past day and age that we just don't need anymore. Fear, you know, be the fear of being ostracized is, uh, is built into our biology, man. Like, you know, we do, we have to be a part of the pack to survive. Uh, the last thing that you want, if you are in a hunter gatherer village is to be kicked out of the tribe, you'll right. die, you know? And so today it's like that, that shows up in different ways. It's like, well, man, do I want to post this on Facebook? Because what if people don't like it? What if people think that I'm being crazy? You know, that that's an old, old fear pattern that is actually not helping you anymore. But it was at one point a survival technique. The mm -hmm. same thing goes for status. And the way that the tier and feudal systems worked inside of, you know, an organization was it, it determined how much food you got access to when you got to eat, whether you ate at the end of the line or the front of the line. And so I feel like today, the biggest thing that people have to realize is that there is no harm in not being the smartest person in the room. And it's actually silly if you're the smartest person in the room. And yeah. 
it's just fear at the end of the day. That's what it comes down to. I mean, it, and that makes sense if you go back a couple hundred years. If you're the, the head honcho, then that's largely to your advantage. But to what you said, if you are the smartest person in the room now, that's not helping you long term. It might be a no. nice little patch your ego and you feel great about yourself because you're you're hanging out with the, the little the metaphorical little kids basically but i can't see how that helps you achieve any sort of growth and if you're not having growth i also don't think you know that you're ha you're hanging out with for lack of a better term the, the dum-dums you you know even if you are the smartest person in your friend group that you're not challenging yourself and there's a it's not based on merit that you're the smartest person that you ever are around. Yep. Yep. All right. Cool, man. So last thing we ask everybody is one of two things, either what's the craziest thing you've seen sold online or what's the craziest tactic you've seen to sell something online. <laughs> it can be crazy good. It can be crazy bad. It can be downright. Sometimes there's almost downright thievery as a crazy tactic. But what's probably, the thing you run into? What's the what's the age group of this of the listenership for this? Usually, it's going to be people who are in online business or interested. So I'd say it's probably mostly twenty five to fifty. Probably the craziest thing I've ever seen was a client of ours a year and a half ago, and um, she was uh, like a spiritual coach, but she was specializing in women who like hadn't had sex in a certain amount of time and she was like a basically a spiritual sex coach that was a little okay. odd that was a that was a tough one for me to really get into and grasp the marketing yeah stuff. sure i had i had troubles with that one um the weirdest tactic for selling things you know like i don't know i don't think this is a task a tactic but i will say you know who dan kennedy is no, right. not right off. Dan, Dan like, Kennedy is like a godfather, direct response trainer. And recently he almost died and okay. he didn't die. He's still with us, at least at the time of this recording. But he wrote a basically a funeral letter. And um, I got to say, like, I'm pretty sure his business grew because of it. But I would like to do that one day. I would like to go ahead and write my letter from my deathbed and sell in it that way when i die my family can reap the rewards of the increased revenue um, yeah. i'm so glad he's alive but none of us really knew if it was like legit or not because it almost seems like it was pre-thought out right. you know what i mean it's like well how did this you already had this letter how did this happen well, wasn't there, there's an old episode of seinfeld where george buys the paintings from the painter he thought was going to die because he thought as soon as he died that the value would go up. Yeah. Reminds me, reminds me of that. Yeah, pretty crazy. All right, man. Well, again, this has been awesome having you on. Had a blast talking to you. For people who are looking to reach out to you, I know we've got the different businesses and things that you're doing. What's your best method of contacts? What's the best website for them to go to to reach you? People can always go to trafficandfunnels.com. Um, all of our own podcast episodes are on that. Instagram. Username is Taylor A. Welch. Facebook, Taylor A. Welch as well. Um, I'm always posting stuff, always talking about what we're doing, both in the real estate and the marketing side. So anywhere on social, we'd love to connect with anybody and chat with them there. All right, perfect. We'll put all those links in the description. And yeah, thanks to everybody watching, being here on the feed of the Proud, the Profitable, where we only talk to legit online businesses. Make sure to review this podcast, subscribe, and we'll catch y'all next time.